challenge. You had to identify the sentence stress and intonation in the given text. Let's see if you got it right. First, let's look at the sentence stress. Here are the words that would likely be stressed in these sentences. You are great at playing the piano. How old were you when you started? I wish I could play. Can you teach me one day? Now let's look at rising intonation. These are the sentences that have rising intonation. Now, remember, we usually use a rising intonation when we ask questions. Now let's look at falling intonation. These are the sentences that have a falling intonation. As you know, we usually use a falling intonation when we give a statement or say a known fact. If you got these now today, we will tackle some of the inconsistencies with English spelling. As you know, English spelling can be quite tricky. Even native speakers often make mistakes. But as your vocabulary expands, it will get easier, I promise. Now, in today's lesson, you will begin to understand the history of English spelling. You will also learn the best method to learn English spelling. Lastly, you will get to know some of the spelling rules. Did you know Albert Einstein was terrible at English spelling? English was his second language, just like yours. He once said, I cannot write in English because of the treacherous spelling. So if you're ever feeling frustrated, just remember that even Einstein struggled with his spelling. Don't give up. Now let's dive straight into core topic one. Why is English spelling so inconsistent? We will begin to uncover why English has its irregularities and how to overcome them. To do this, it's important to know the history of English spelling. Now, many people, including native speakers, often find themselves asking, why on earth is that word spelled like that? For example, though, cough, and thought all contain O-U-G-H, yet their pronunciations differ completely. Isn't it strange? Now there are many more examples of strange spelling patterns in English. Think back to lesson one. We learned about words with silent letters that don't get pronounced, like thumb and foreign. In schools, teachers usually tell their students, that's just the way it is. But let's explore why it is the way it is. To do that, we have to explore the four parts that make up English. Germanic, French, Latin, and Greek. The core of the English language is Germanic. Germanic is a branch of languages, not to be mistaken with the German language. Christian missionaries first came to England in 600 AD. They brought with them the Roman alphabet. This is the alphabet we still use for English writing today. Now, these missionaries found Anglo-Saxons who spoke a Germanic language. The Anglo-Saxons Germanic language had some sounds that the missionaries didn't know. For example, the sound kh. Now, we use the letter X to show the sound kh. Try not to get confused there. 
Now they had to find a way to write the ch sound with the Roman alphabet, so they settled on G H. Think about the words thought, cough, and though. Do you see the letters G H? Yes. But do any of these words have the ch sound? No. There is no ch sound in English today. Well, then why are the letters G H there? That's because over many years people started pronouncing these words differently. In some words, like though, there used to be a ch sound, but the ch sound completely disappeared over time. In other words, like cough, there used to be a ch sound, but it changed to f, becoming cough. There were other pronunciation shifts too. Some sounds completely disappeared. Think back to those silent letters from lesson one. People stopped pronouncing the b at the end of thumb and climb. This is the case for many other silent letters we see in English today. Now you may be thinking, why didn't they change the spelling along with the pronunciation? And you know what? That is indeed a very good question. Well, unfortunately, by the time the pronunciation shift was complete, the spelling had already been finalized. Now, some inconsistencies in English spelling are a result of the influence of French. In 1066, the French Normans took over England. French became the language of prestige and power. As a result, many English words now have spellings that look like French. For example, beauty and quote. Some words were even directly taken from French. For example, cul-de-sac and restaurant. Now, in the late 1500s, some Renaissance scholars changed the spelling of some English words. They wanted English to reflect the ancient world. So, some English words were given more Latin and Greek characteristics. For example, the spelling of salmon was changed to salmon with an L even though we don't pronounce the L. This was done to reflect the spelling of the Latin word salmo. Choir was changed to choir to reflect the spelling of the Greek word gorodia. Hopefully by now you have a better understanding of why English spelling is so tricky. It can be frustrating to have to deal with so many inconsistencies. But at the same time, you know why English spelling is the way it is. Now, let's talk about how to overcome the spelling challenges you have been facing. If you are looking for a practical spelling trick, try this method. Next time you write in English, Copy and paste the writing into Microsoft Word. Make sure your language settings have been changed to English. You will notice that some of the words are underlined in red. As you may know, this means that the word is spelt incorrectly. You can right click on the word and the correct spelling and the definition of the word will show up. But what if you don't want to rely on your computer? Remember, your IELTS exam will be handwritten and there will be no computers available on which you can check your spelling. 
there is one method that will truly help you to internalize English spelling conventions. That method is to get a notebook and make a vocabulary list. Every time you come across a word you don't know how to spell, look it up in the dictionary. Then write down the word and its definition in the notebook. You might be asking, why does that method work? Well, research shows that when you write information down by hand, many parts of your brain work together and make connections. This helps you to remember things more easily. The more you expand your vocabulary list in your notebook, the better you will remember the spelling of the words. In your writing abilities, we now know that English is a very inconsistent language. However, it isn't a language without rules. There are some rules you can follow to make English spelling a little simpler for you. And that is what Core Topic 2 is all about. Let's go over some English spelling rules that will help you as you work to improve your writing skills. First up, the silent E. Often, when the letter E is at the end of a word, we don't pronounce it. But it does greatly affect the meaning and pronunciation of a word. For example, kit and kite, bit and bite. So the letter E changes the I sound in kit and bit to I in kite and bite. Do you see what difference the letter E can make? It's not limited to the I sound. For example, cut and cute. In this case, the letter E changes the a uh sound in cut to u in cute. Let's see what happens to the letter A. Pan and pain. Can and cane. So, when the letter E is at the end, the sound a eh in pan and can changes to A in pain and cane. Let's look at some other examples. Sham turns into shame. Slim turns into slime. Tub turns into tube. As you can see, it's important to know when to add the letter E to the end of a word. If you're not sure, you could ask yourself, is the vowel in the word a short vowel? If so, there usually won't be an E at the end. Is the vowel in the word a longer vowel? If so, there is a good chance that there should be an E at the end. Now, before we can move on to our next spelling rule, it's important to understand what suffixes are. Now, a suffix is something you can add to the end of a word to alter its meaning slightly. Here are some examples of suffixes. Now, let's take the base word Sprint. Sprint is a verb in present tense. In order to change it to past tense, we add the suffix ed, changing it to sprinted. Let's look at another example, the adjective green. To say that something is more green than something else, we add the suffix er, changing it to the comparative form greener. This next rule has to do with adding suffixes to words that end in y. What if you need to add a suffix to a word that ends with the letter y? Let's look at the adjective happy. 
Let's put that into comparative form like we just did with green, turning into greener. Can we simply add ER to the word happy? No, happy ends in Y, so we need to replace the letter Y with the letter I before adding the suffix ER. Now we can add ER, changing it to happier. Let's look at the verb, fry. What if we want to change it to past tense? Can we simply add ed like we did with sprint, turning it to sprinted? No, because fry ends with the letter y. So, once again, we replace the letter y with the letter i. And then we can add our suffix ed turning it to fried. Now before we can move on to our next spelling rule, it's important to understand consonants. Consonants are sounds that are made in the mouth by stopping airflow with parts of your mouth, like with your tongue or teeth. These are all the consonants in English. As you can see, there are many. Vowels are the rest of the letters. The letters that allow more free flow of air in the mouth. The vowels in English are A, E, I, O, U and sometimes Y. There are long vowels and short vowels. Long vowels take a bit longer to say. Listen to the vowels in plane, boot, sheet and Cow. Can you hear how long the sounds are? Short vowels are quicker to say. Listen to the vowels in skip, cot, lift and camp. Can you hear how quick the sounds are? Let's look at the next spelling rule. When we add suffixes to a word that ends in a consonant, for example clap, you might need to add another consonant, or in other words, double the consonant. For example, clapping with an extra P instead of clapping with just one P. So, if a word ends in one of the consonants, and you need to add a suffix, you will possibly need to double the consonant at the end of the word. Sometimes it's necessary to double the consonant and sometimes it isn't. For example, is it raining with two N's or raining with one N? Is it beginner with two N's or beginner with one N? Well, there are a few questions you can ask yourself. Firstly, does the word end in one L? For example, level. If it ends in one L, double the consonant. Level becomes leveling with two Ls. If it doesn't end in one L, how many consonants are at the end of the word? Call and walk each have two consonants at the end. No need to add another consonant. Just add the suffix. For example, walk turns to walking and call turns to called. Before we can ask the next questions, first let's go over the concept of syllables. Syllables are often referred to as the beats of spoken language. When we say a word, we can count the number of beats or syllables in a word by clapping. Let's try it with the word character. Let's use the clapping method. Character. We clapped three times, so there are three syllables. 
So let's go back to the questions we ask ourselves when we add suffixes to words that end in consonants. What if the word has only one consonant at the end? Well, then you need to ask how many syllables are in the word. How many syllables does the word win have? Remember, to count syllables, we can use the clapping method. When. I clapped once, so there is one syllable. The next question is, is the vowel in when a short vowel? Yes, it's a short vowel. If it were a long vowel, it would have been ween. But it's when, a short vowel. Since it's a short vowel, you can go ahead and double the consonant. Win becomes winning or winner. What if the word also has one syllable but has a long vowel sound? For example, boom. If that's the case, there's no need to double the consonant. Just add the suffix. Boom becomes boomed or booming. We just looked at one syllable words, but what if there are two syllables? Well, then you need to ask yourself, is the vowel in the last syllable, i.e. the syllable on the far right, a short vowel? Let's look at begin. There are two syllables in begin. Remember, we can use the clapping method. Begin. Is the vowel in the last syllable a short vowel? Yes, it's a short vowel. It's not begin, it's begin. Now, is the last syllable stressed? In other words, is the emphasis or strength on the last syllable? In the case of begin, the stress is indeed on the last syllable. It's not begin, it's begin. In that case, we double the consonant. Begin becomes beginning or beginner with two N's. Let's look at a two-syllable word with no emphasis on the last syllable, like offer. It's not offer, it's offer. There is no stress on the last syllable. So, there's no need to double the consonant. Offer becomes offering or offered with just one R. Now, if there is a two-syllable word with a long sound in the last syllable, like avoid, no matter the stress, there is no need to double the consonant. Avoid becomes avoided or avoider with just one D. Now, I would like to challenge you to practice your knowledge from today's lesson. Write the words below by correctly adding the suffixes to the words. See if you can come up with the answers on your own without using spell check.